Okay, let me start. My name is Tom Finkel Pearl from New York City, and I'm going to talk about socially engaged arts in the United States. And what I want to do is to give some context, really where it came from, not just to talk about um, what's going on. Because I think a lot of times people sort of dive into socially engaged art without thinking of the, the history behind it. So first of all, I just want to say in the audience here, who's the artists? Okay, who are people writing about art? Students? Okay, and then you are none of those. What, tell me what category you would be, find yourself in. Okay, just visitors, uh, lovers of art and visitors to Documenta. Okay, great. Um, if I can have the first slide, please. Okay, so, Oh, by the way, the other question is, anybody in this audience ever read my book on socially engaged art? Ah, this will be a little bit boring for, at the beginning for you. Okay, so this is coming out of that. So in the United States, uh, I'm just going to start with the, the roots of it in the 1960s. I feel that in the 1960s, there was a huge change in the way people thought about the world and the way people thought about art. And the biggest and most uh, important, let's say, um, uproar or overthrowing of the tradition was the civil rights movement. So if you think about this as a civil rights march in the South, people from the North were coming South, people from the South were demanding rights. We had legally sanctified apartheid in the United States during my lifetime. This is when I was a child. It was outrageous, it was horrific. Racial segregation was the law of the land in the South, and people were fed up with it, and they said, we're gonna make a change. And the way that they made the change was not only in a political movement, but a political movement that often embraced collectivity and collective action. Collective action was sort of on the table in a way in the United States, and I think this is true for a lot of places, but my experience and my knowledge really is just the United States. So you think about the civil rights movement, you think about uh, organizations within the, the um, NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. There were sort of the liberal organizations and the radical organizations, but collectivity and collective action was the way that we we're gonna solve these problems. These problems could not be solved on an individual basis, and they couldn't be solved simply by electoral politics, although electrical, electoral politics were extremely important simultaneously. Next slide, please. So here is a quote. Everybody must know Martin Luther King. He said, through our scientific and technologic genius, we have made of this world a neighborhood, and yet we have not had the ethical commitment to make of it a brotherhood. By the way, still we have gendered language throughout the 60s, a brotherhood 
meaning a collectivity, but I want to acknowledge that as well. We must all learn to live together as brothers, or we will all perish together as fools. We are tied together in a single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. So that idea that a network of mutuality was going to be the way that we were going to heal some of the problems that we had in the United States was in the air. It was in the air in racial politics. It was in the air in politics against our intervention in the war in Vietnam. And very importantly, I think, for this discussion, next slide, please. Um, uh, okay, so simultaneous, I'll get, I'll get to feminism in a second, but this slide also is, there was a group called the Students for a Democratic Society, SDS. SDS was a group of uh, activists, often on campus. It started in places like Berkeley, and they got together in a very famous moment at the beginning of the uh, anti-war movement in a place called Port Huron. It was, it's near the University of Michigan. A lot of this stuff was very tied to universities. And this is part of what's called the Port Huron Statement, which was the founding document, really, of SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society. So here, um, written collectively, it was very much, I think, in the spirit of this documenta, all of this was collectivities. SDS was a democratic, horizontally organized, um, uh, anti-war, anti, I'd say anti-fascist organization. In a participatory democracy, the political life would be based on several root principles. And this is, by the way, you could say this about pretty much about Documenta, right? That participatory decision-making of a social consequence be carried on by public groupings, that politics be positively, as they are, uh, uh, as the art of collectively creating an acceptable pattern of social relations, that politics has the function of bringing together people out of isolation and into community, thus being a necessary, though not sufficient, means of finding meaning in personal life. So I, th I love that statement. Again, I feel like that could have been a statement on a wall as you entered this documenta. But also this idea of being in community and having that be something that's going to heal your life as well as heal this country. This is what was in the air politically, and this is the, again, the founding document of Students for a Democratic Society. Next slide, please. In all over the country, but I'm going to particularly, I'm a New Yorker, so I'll focus on New York City. There's a, a group called New York Radical Women. This is an organization, it's a feminist organization, and there was this advent of the group, the group therapy, group discussion. This is a meeting of, um, of that group. And so the idea was, again, the famous uh, statement by a woman named Carol Hanisch said, we're gonna make the personal political, right? So your personal life is a political gesture, um, and the way that your personal life plays out politically is through the group. So there were these group sessions, they got together and they talked about everything from uh, you know, feminist politics, the politics of, uh, of marriage, the politics of gender, the politics. But there was a particular moment in one of these sessions where they were talking about the Miss America pageant. And do, do they have beauty pageants like that that were central to the life of other countries? In America, in my generation, everybody was watching the Miss America pageant. Do you have that elsewhere? Did people have that? It was terrible. Oh my God, it's embarrassing to think about it. But we all, I mean, even in a very progressive family, I come from a family of, you know, left-leaning, um, you watch the Miss America pageant. The Miss America pageant was, you know, women who would get up there and, and this, this very embarrassing sort of interviews, but then they would be in a bathing suit and all this stuff. It's a very, you know, terrible way of representing women. In one of these uh, um, New York Radical women, the woman, Carol Hanisch, who, who is the person who coined that phrase, the personal is political, brought up the discussion of Miss America. And they were discussing and they were saying, this is terrible. You know, I watched this. I grew up with it. We have to do something. We have to confront Miss America. So they actually decided, um, having been studying what was going on in the South, having decided, uh, studied the Students for a Democratic Society, I'm, I'm, not, I'm sorry, SNCC, 
which was a, the black uh, political organizing committee that did a lot of work in the South, they said, let's go to the Miss America and let's confront it. Next slide, please. Oh, so, okay, so you put together, you take feminism, you add this idea of what's called a snap action, which is basically a public performance. SNCC, uh, which was the political organizing committee. I, I can't even remember what SNCC stands for. Anybody remember SNCC? SNCC? Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Yes, students. So again, it's taking place at college campuses, SNCC. So you take feminism, you add SNCC, and then SNCC, again, the idea of the SNAP action, the collective SNAP action, was something that SNCC did all the time. Next slide. So they went to the Miss America pageants and did a performance. And so this performance uh, is in a way pre precursor to one of the great mothers of collective art in, in America, Merle Eucles. They cleaned the boardwalk, you know, symbolically. They said, that's what we do as women. You know, forget about this Miss America pageant. We're workers, we're maintenance workers, whatever. They had a trash can in which they threw their bras in there and set it on fire. It was street theater. It was collective political street theater under the banner of feminism growing out of the group therapy session, the New York Radical Women. All of this stuff is, sounds very familiar, right? It sounds like the kind of art that people are doing under the banner of socially engaged art right now. They did think of this as art, they thought of it as theater, but it wasn't in any way connected to the art world. Nobody here, there were no curators involved, there were no museums involved, no art centers. It was action by women who are taking control of their own self-representation. And by the way, this was all over the papers. This was on the front page of papers all over the country. You know, snap action by New York radical women protesting in this America pageant. And the reason it was all over the papers was that they went to Atlantic City, they went to the site of where all the media was there to cover the Miss America pageant and tried to change the narrative of the Miss America pageant away from this kind of sexist vision of objectifying women to something that women were going to say, here's how we want to be represented. This is self-representation. I thought it was one of those incredible moments. But again, it hadn't penetrated the art world until, next slide. Anybody know this artist? OK, so there's a woman named Merle Latterman Eucles. She was an artist. She went to art school. She was doing these kind of big inflatable projects, big inflatable sculptures. And then she had a baby, and then she had another baby. And she wrote in 1969 an incredible text, which I highly recommend everybody look up, called The Maintenance Art Manifesto. She said, I am separately doing two things in my life right now. I'm making art, and I am a maintenance worker. As a maintenance worker, I'm at home, I'm cleaning, I'm washing. And she said, I'm going to flush up into consciousness this idea that my maintenance can be art. So she made, she started making maintenance art. Maintenance art, in this particular case, is washing the, the uh, front steps of uh, America's oldest museum, the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut. This is a famous thing. She started doing these washes. She did, uh, you know, it's just a whole bunch of different things. As a making the personal political, which was to say, my personal life as a maintenance worker, which is what I do most of the time, I'm not making art in my studio, I'm going to make art, which is maintenance art. Next slide, please. Around that time, we had a fiscal crisis in New York City. The finances were in extremely bad shape. Um, and one of the things that was happening in New York City in the late 60s was it was very hard to pick up the trash. We didn't really have enough money to really fully fund the sanitation department in New York City. It was getting quite dirty. And um, so meanwhile, Merle Eucles was doing this maintenance art, and there was an article in the Village Voice saying, you know, artist Merle Eucles, uh, you know, is making maintenance art. And it said, uh, maybe we could apply for the National Endowment for the Arts and get some funding from the National Endowment for the Arts to keep New York City clean. It's sort of a joke. So we've got arts funding, 
to clean the streets of New York City. However, as fate would have it, the sanitation commissioner of New York City was reading that article. Why a sanitation commissioner was reading a review of a feminist artist in the Village Voice, I do not know. But he said, um, called, found out Merle Euclid's number, called her up and said, how would you like to make art with 11,000 sanitation workers? And famously said, I will be right over. And she became the artist in residence of New York City's Department of Sanitation for 40 years, starting with this article and starting with that moment that she came to sanitation as a feminist maintenance artist. She said, I have brothers in New York City. Those brothers of mine are sanitation workers. And this is one of those jumps across class boundaries that doesn't usually happen in the art world, but it did. She became, the first thing she did as the artist in residence of the Department of Sanitation is she went in, in a kind of spiral pattern to each of the sanitation uh, garages in New York City, looked each of the sanitation workers, here, you have to shake my hand. She shook hand with each worker and said, thank you for keeping New York City alive. 11,000 times to each of the workers. She got to know, this was her entry point as artist in residence. She met every single worker. It took her a year and a half. She was there at dawn every morning at sanitation garages and saying, thank you for keeping New York City alive. So her entrance gesture as a feminist performance artist to a incredibly, completely male-dominated zone of sanitation workers was gratitude. Thank you. Because she said, this city doesn't exist. This city doesn't function without, um, without sanitation. One of the famous lines in the Maintenance Art Manifesto was, after the revolution, who's going to clean up on Monday morning? Right? So it's all this revolutionary jargon, but nobody's thinking of those systems that keep cities alive. So, okay, so this is one of those moments I was talking about New York radical women, their gesture on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, jumping into the art world and into the steps of a museum was Merle Latterman Euclid. Next slide, please. Simultaneous to this was Fluxus. Fluxus was a performance group in New York City, um, mostly male dominated, but a famous Fluxus artist was Yoko Ono. And they were doing these performances, which were then very kind of art world oriented. Um, and this is called Cut Piece, in which Yoko Ono would sit on the stage and invite people to come and cut her clothing off. It became quite hard to look at sometimes, sort of violent, but it was, that, it was a famous performance by Yoko Ono. So this is the kind of performance, but again, very much inside of the art world inside of that sort of the sanctum of the gallery. Uh, and so another famous uh, sort of Flexus or Flexus adjacent artist was uh, Alan Capro. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, yes. Um, so this is the era of the happenings, right? So there was a period of where the happenings would be something you went to, uh, where you would be an audience member and something would happen, like in the case of cut piece by Yoko Ono. There was the audience, and then there was the artist. In the case of what began to happen at these uh, Capro happenings was that there was no audience. There were only participants. So this, I don't even know what they're doing here, but just the image of this uh, happening, you can see that everybody's just running around doing something on the basis of some very basic instruction, which I don't know in particular what this was. But there was that moment again of going from the um, participatory project with an audience to the activated audience where there are no spectators, only participants. And I feel like one of the things that interesting about Documenta, I've only been here for one day, but I think that that's probably what it's like in, there's 16 members and they're all community oriented groups in lots of different parts of the world. In those places, I visited um, in Cuba, uh, Tanya Bergera's school. We're in Tanya Bergera's or in the project organized by Tanya Bergera and Instar. And by the way, I should have started by thanking you and thanking Tanya Bergera for inviting me here today. So thank you to the Instar folks. Um, it's a collective, and you, you guys could actually tell me 
if this is true or not. But when I went to Cuba to visit her project, which was a Arte de Conducta, which is a sort of performance arts school, everybody was a participant. There was no audience. It was just a project in which you went to this place and learned together collectively. Anyway, so this is this collective learning model, collective action model, which became, in a way, what the, um, what the, uh, uh, what, what happened to, in a way, later generation happenings. Next slide, please. I do have to say we're in Germany. I must make a nod to Joseph Boyce. Any Germans here? <laughs> it's funny, it's like, here we are, there's one German. Um, <laughs> one of the really, oh, two, okay. One of the very mar important moments in New York, three. One of the very <laughs> important moments in New York City for this kind of action was a lecture that Joseph, Joseph Boyce gave at the New School. And there's a transcript of this. Actually, it's a very um, fantastic transcript because things got completely out of hand and people are yelling from the audience. So this is Joseph Boyce standing up on stage doing a performance lecture with a text. But what I thought was most interesting about it was, again, how, first of all, by the time Joseph Boyce showed up, there were, uh, and I can't remember what year, it's in the 70s, he showed up, and the whole place is packed. It's a very large auditorium. And there are three or 400 people waiting outside, extremely angry that they couldn't get in. And again, it created this sort of very chaotic atmosphere. But he was the, you know, saying, and he said famously then and many other times, you know, that everybody is an artist or everybody can be an artist. And it was that idea that was enacted in a way in that lecture of, of the mutual action. Like as if we were having this lecture here and people are getting up and yelling at me, which is, by the way, completely permitted any moment that somebody, we'll have some questions later on. But uh, Joseph Boyce, again, I would, you know, sprinkle that outside atmosphere. I was saying, if you start with civil rights, you add in uh, feminism, you mix that together back with SNCC, you put in the uh, idea of the happening, you make it into a collective happening, and then a little bit of stuff coming from outside. And I would say the major force would be somebody like Joseph Boyce and maybe from Latin America, the ideas of Paulo Freire, which was bubbling up at that time, which is the liber liberation pedagogy, uh, pedagogy of the oppressed, etc. Next slide, please. Okay. This is uh, Joseph Boyce. I I'll read it out loud if you have trouble. I would like to declare why I feel it is now necessary to establish a new kind of art, able to show the problems of the world, of the whole society, of every living being, and how this new discipline, which I call social sculpture, can realize the future of humankind. Very high aspirations. <laughs> Not just the art world, humankind. Here my idea is to declare that art is the only possibility of evolution, the only possibility to change the situation in the world but then you have to enlarge the idea of art to include the whole creativity. And if you do that, it follows logically that every living being is an artist, an artist in the same sense that he can develop his own creativity. Again, gendered language, I would apologize for that. That was the way that people said those things in those days. So it's, they can develop their creativity. But in any case, that was a big issue, a big influence that came into the art world was this idea of collective creativity and that everybody is an artist. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm now gonna jump ahead. That was all the background stuff. I was saying I was gonna give a report on sort of, you know, collective uh, creative action in New York City. Okay. We're now jumping ahead a generation. A young artist is in Houston, young African-American artist who grew up as a sharecropper in Mississippi, one of eight children, picking the crops. You know what a sharecropper is? The whole family would go from one farm to another, picking cotton, picking vegetables, and they would get a share of the profits. That's how poor this young fellow was. He moved to Houston, he became an artist. He went to art uh, school a little bit, studied painting. This artist's name is Rick Lowe, L-O-W-E. Rick was giving a lecture, maybe not unlike this, at a, a museum, or no, at his studio, uh, to some visiting folks, students. And one of the students said to him, if artists have these creative ideas, why are you talking about problems instead of proposing solutions? 
And this was a moment of crisis in Rico's life. He was doing art that was very political, but art that was not social. He got together with a bunch of people at that time. It's a collective, not unlike many of the collectives that are here in Documenta today. And started something called Project Row Houses, which has grown into this enormous social sculpture. Do people here know, anybody heard of Rick Lowe? Okay, yeah, okay, so maybe, that's good. So he was inspired by, by Joseph Boyce. He said, he calls it social sculpture. He gives Joseph Boyce credit all the time for, in a way, the, germinating this idea of the social sculpture. Rick Lowe's social sculpture, in a way, took it to a different generation of what, uh, what Joseph Boyce ever did. This is a street. This is all part, part of this social sculpture. It started with these eight buildings here, or 10. These are what are called shotgun houses in the south. That's where low-income black people often lived, in these little houses, had a porch in the front, uh, several rooms, a shotgun house meant you could take a shotgun and shoot from the front door through the back door, and there were no, <laughs> no walls in between. That's why it's called a shotgun house. Uh, he calls them row houses because the shotgun, you know, it sounds very violent. He and a group of, of African-American friends bought these, this property. It was very important to think about the idea of home ownership for black people in the United States is very low. Um, they bought it and they started to develop projects within those. Um, by the way, this is Jesse, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the other founders. That's not Rick Lowe. I think Rick will appear in others. So they, then they mobilized the arts. Um, so they bought the houses and they started doing individual artist projects in the houses. They mobilized the arts community in Houston. They asked the museums to adopt a house. So this might be the Museum of Fine Arts. This might be the Contemporary Museum. All museums have these crews of very talented people. The art handlers went down there. They fixed up the houses. And that got this started. They renovated the houses and made it into an art center. Beyond that, they said, let's, they bought some more houses and then had some houses constructed because there are a lot of single mothers in that community with very severe social problems. They started something called the Single Mothers Program in which people lived there. They had educational programs in which um, people could get a degree, could, could um, move their life forward. They had daycare so people could go to school. It was a two-year program, a two-year residential program. I've been to the graduation of that program, by the way, and what's interesting to me is when you came to the graduation of that program, people were saying, I am so happy to have participated in this art project for the last two years. That's very different from saying, this is great social services. Thank you, because social services are based on deficit. The art project was, I'm part of an art project. I'm an artist. I'm a Joseph Boyce artist because everybody's an artist. It was incredible. The women who were coming out of it were happy to have been there, but also happy to have contributed to an environment which was an overall arts environment. Then they said, well, we're graduating people, but there's nowhere to go. So they actually started building housing. They started building low-income housing, which people could graduate from the program and move into the low-income housing. Right now, Rick, so Rick Lowe stayed at this project as an artist for 22 years. And we are just talking about before with some of the audience members, this idea of duration. For a lot of the projects that you're seeing around Documenta, these are projects that go on for years. 100 days is a long time, but it's a very short period of time for a social project. 22 years later, Rick Lowe was burned out, handed it on to other people. So it's still going, it's a vibrant place, it's doing well, it's become a nonprofit, and it has 54 buildings. They have built buildings, they built experimental green buildings with Rice School of Architecture, they have built uh, more housing. By the way, the housing, it turned out, Project Grow Houses, which a bunch of artists, a bunch of nonprofit people, they said, we're terrible landlords, we should not be running Resident. So they actually spun off the uh, low-income housing. That's a separate organization, a community development organization. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, this is some of the housing that they built. Um, and by the way, it's quite interesting. So this, this is actually the picture that's on the front of my book. Uh, and this woman here, 
this is taken. This picture was taken 17 years ago. I uh, was at an event uh, a couple of weeks ago. Rick Lowe has now turned into this fantastic painter. Had a big show in New York City, and that woman uh, showed up and said, "I'm on the front of your book." I was like, "What are you talking about?" And she said, "Yeah, I'm now his studio manager." And this guy, this is her husband. Anyway, so it's a community that stays in touch. It's not a here today, gone tomorrow uh, arts project. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, Queens Museum, which is a place that I used to work, where I worked on a project with Tanya Bergera. So we, this is a picture of the lobby of the Queens Museum with a pro program going on with a uh, group, which, um, oh, I'm forgetting the name of it. Oh, Eugenia, you're going to have to help me. It's the group that brings in uh, students. You were honored at their gala. I, I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, it's a group. Uh, that introduces low-income people to the arts, not by saying, come in for one visit, but by going to the school, meeting the people, talking to the parents, saying, what kind of programs would you like, talking to kids, um, having some people come over for a quick visit and then leave, and then culminating in a big event at the museum. This is the culminating event. Hundreds of people show up. But it was the idea to create repeat visitors, not to just have one visit. So we did a lot of this kind of thing at the Queens Museum, um, and, and it created long-term audience for the museum. Um, but most of what we were doing was still in the museum. So the museum was progressive. We were, having, we were trying to build our, our audience out. We were inviting people into our precinct. But an important moment happened when an artist invited us out into the community to do a project at a crossroads, an important crossroads, in our vicinity uh, in Corona, Queens. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's another example of the kind of social project we're doing within the museum. So this is an artist uh, named Pedro Reyes from Mexico City. What's unusual about the Queens Museum, or unique, is that in the 1940s, when the United Nations was looking for a home and actually decided to move to New York City. They were looking for a home and they, they used the building that the Queens Museum is now in for two or three years. So important things happened, like the partition of Palestine happened in our building. The United Nations was there. So the artist Pedro Reyes said, let's use that history. And since Queens is actually the most culturally diverse place in the United States of America, he said, we could do a project around the UN and invite people. In, in America, we have a program called the Model UN. In the Model UN, you could go in and say, I could represent Pakistan, and you could represent uh, Russia, whatever. In, the, in this UN, in this UN project, you had to actually be from the country. You had to be from Mexico. And so these are people from all over the world who live in Queens, and we hired a group uh, called the Urban Bushwomen, which is a performance art group to and we had a weekend, which was the, U the People's United Nations, P-U-N, People's United Nations. So it was a collective project. People got to know each other. It was a social project. But it was a, a short-term social project. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. It was an incredible weekend. And a, especially some groups from some parts of the world, like the Central Asians all got together. They're still friends uh, from Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, et cetera, like that. So this was a social project taking place within the precincts of the museum. Next slide, please. Not far from the Queens Museum is a place called Corona Plaza. Corona Plaza is a crossroads in the community. Corona is one of the poorest places uh, in New York City. It has a largely immigrant population with a large percentage of undocumented immigrants. This is a, we began to do project based on an artist inviting us out to do a project at that crossroads. And this is one of those festivals we did this is a Native American dance group. There's a, when I say Native American, there's a lot of people in Queens who are, who are indigenous folks from different parts of Latin America. So they had a dance group. So up here, so this is one of our festivals. We did dozens and dozens of these festivals. These uh, tents here are, um, they are social service agencies. So people are there telling people how you can open a bank account, where you can get your medical needs taken place. So we're using the arts in a way to draw a crowd. And you know these are really great art projects, but often very community oriented. And then, then trying to connect people with real life social service. 
So this was very effective. It was very, the, there were always big audiences. It was a little bit like this, which is there were just people walking through all the time. In, so if it rained, everybody left. 15 minutes later, there's a subway stop right over here. Uh, people would get out of the subway and start joining into these festivals. But the criticism from the community that we kept hearing was, these things come and go quite quickly. You have performances here. A performance might be something that starts and stops in an afternoon or maybe goes on for a week or two. Next slide, please. So this is when uh, Tanya Bergera came to our neighborhood. And uh, it's a long story, but it ended up with finding a storefront for an organization that she called Immigrant Movement International. This project started as a one-year project. Creative Time was our partner in New York City. And that project ended up lasting seven years. In those seven years, about 35,000 people a year would come and participate in programs there. Next slide, please. So there are different kinds of, of uh, events that would happen in that space. And one event, this is an event which is um, what are called dreamers in the United States that uh, if you're an undemented teenager, in other words, in the United States without papers, uh, it got dubbed as Dreamers because it was something called the Dream Act. So this is a dream. Every person in this room was undocumented, and they were talking about how to engage politically and artistically in their community. So that kind of thing, it really wasn't an art event. It was a political event organized by an immigrant rights organization. Next slide. This is an art event. By the way, this is uh, Rick Lowe right here from Project Row Houses giving us some advice. This is the city council member. This is me back in the old days. So this is the art world showing up to have a conversation. We were kind of upset that the art world didn't show up and didn't care. Uh, for one thing, this uh, project unfolded entirely in Spanish. So a lot of people in the art world don't speak Spanish. But after the first weeks or first months of us being upset that the art world didn't come, except for occasional special events, we realized that this project was not for the art world. This project was for people in that community, and people in that community kept coming, coming, coming. So 30, if say, I say 35,000 people were coming, there were people in the community that would come 100 times a year for seven years. And that was so important, and, and two groups came out of this that are still alive today. One was a kind of... Uh, dance group called Mujeres en Movimiento, which is sort of a feminist dance group, uh, which is also dance therapy. And the other was uh, the sort of child of this organization, this place called Centro Corona, which still exists. So again, that's relevant to this documenta in the sense that we have all these community-oriented or, um, you know, uh, projects from all over the world, but who's coming through? It's like, it's us, the art world. This is not people from the local section of DACA where this group down here is normally uh, unfolding their program. Next slide, please. By the way, I'm getting to the end of my presentation soon, and I want people to ask questions, especially violent and negative questions like the Joseph voice. <laughs> Just kidding. Next slide. Next slide, please. Is that, maybe that's the last slide. Hey, can you check it? This, I think, is maybe the last slide. Okay, if that is the last slide. Um, let me just say that, uh, hold on, I, I do see a question. That's great. Um, oh, yeah. So, I think some of the issues I've been trying to bring up or trying to connect them to what's happening here is a question of duration. Like, does it make sense to have a project uh, that to, to represent engaged projects in a period of 100 days? I, I do think so. I'm a big fan of that idea because it's representing it back to the art world, which can bring resources and bring understanding and inspire other artists. And the second question, I think a major question on the table is like, who's it for? And if it's for the art world, that's fine, like the Pedro Reyes project. Even though people are from all over the world, you know, a lot of people were sort of artsy types. Okay, Eugenie, you have the microphone. Don't ask the question until you have the microphone in your hand, because this is being recorded for... Uh... Hi. 
Hi. Um, so there is the art world. There is the art market. There is the socially engaged art. They all come from different perspectives because there are different stakeholders, right? And the socially engaged art space where, you know, whatever you talked about, it exists in between a bit of art practice, facilitation, um, social practice, almost like social work, but then not quite like being a social worker because you're not there as a social worker. So then this is where it's interesting because it's so difficult to get financial sustainability for socially engaged art. And my question is, should there be integration between the art market, art world, and this socially engaged art space? Because the money comes for, from different sources for different reasons. And when I do a socially engaged art project, if I want to exhibit something, it's almost like documentation of a project that I have to produce and output for the exhibition. But then that becomes a work that is completely different from what I did with the community. What, what are your thoughts around that? I mean, this is an eternal question, and I don't know. I think you should, you have to turn that off when I'm talking, okay, I think, yeah. So that's a great question. It's kind of the eternal question, which is financial sustainability. And this, by the way, Project Grow Houses is now on solid ground, but immigrant movement, there were problems all the time with money. I mean, I have to, I experienced that. So, I mean, there is a model, which is, uh, let's say Titus Kafar is a successful artist in the art market, and he is funding, he has a nonprofit, it's called Next Haven, which is a social project in New Haven, Connecticut. And he's using the money, he's selling the art. You know, this is uh, Theaster Gates in Chicago. But then, in a way, what you have to do is figure out how to become a star in the art market, which might not be something you're even remotely interested in doing, or quite frankly, capable of, right? I mean, not everybody becomes a star. So it's such an easy thing to say, just become a star in the art market and fund it from that. It's like hundreds of thousands of artists in the world are trying to become that star with or without a social vision. So there is that model. The other model then, um, so for example, we, we went to a gala recently, which was for three social projects. And it was enlisting the art world. So how to create the, the sort of bridge to the rich donors uh, is another question. And the thing is, are you from the States or from? Um, I work quite a lot in Europe, um, but I'm from Singapore. Okay. So, yeah. So, I mean, in, in the States, we have this long tradition of private philanthropy, which I think is a terrible idea and people should not follow it. And it's based on a whole set of, you know, exclusionary practices at major cultural institutions. However, it does mean that rich people are often ready to, to shell out big amounts of money and to join boards of, let's say, your socially engaged art project, right? So you create the project and you connect to those rich people. We saw a bunch of rich people just last week wedding to give money to social projects. So, I mean, look, I, I'm all in favor of more robust government funding. I think government funding should recognize these social projects for the value. And so one of the things, so I used to be the commissioner of cultural affairs for New York City. I was running the New York City funding mechanism for the arts. And one of the things that we did was we did a survey uh, to, to see the value of arts throughout New York City. It's called the social impact of the arts. We all know that there's economic impact. Impact, that economic is great. It's based on tourism, which is, by the way, terrible for the environment. You know, tourism accounts for a very big slice of our carbon footprint as a species. But um, there is a value to social engagement through the arts in communities, and we quantified it. It's good for health, it's good for education, it's good for safety especially health. Communities are healthier if people are engaged in the arts. If you can show that to government, and I was government at the time, show it to ourselves, that helps put more money into projects. So we were then able to increase, to some degree, the funding for local projects within communities. So I mean, that's the other thing is, again, I, I would see that's a long-term proposition, but how do you get governments involved in supporting these projects? And the, I mean, the art market for sure, but the art market is based on elitism and everything else. I think the real gap is around advocacy because we talk about art, but actually art is really diverse. When you talk about film, it's completely different when you talk about visual art or you talk about socially engaged art. And not many people understand social art, community art, and all the different definitions or terms that's available out there. And I think the thing about philanthropy is also 
people don't understand enough from different sectors and also from the government space like oh art is just painting or sculpture and that's the that's the most common sort of understanding but then how do you explain like sometimes you know a workshop can be an art and for me i think this is where it's interesting because as an artist i'm, I'm always being asked you know like how is your work in art then where where is the art and sometimes when you're working with communities that that it doesn't matter anymore. And what, what does this mean for the art scene in terms of changing and opening up the landscape and what we understand of what art is? <laughs> yeah, these are not questions that's possible to answer because you've been thinking about it for a long time. I think the other question is, are there other alternative models aside from the art market? So um, there's a project in our, in our neighborhood in, in Manhattan. It's called... Um, Black Gotham Experience. Black Gotham Experience is not a nonprofit. Uh, and the eventual idea, the goal is, and they've just gotten some, they got some philanthropic money through a resource, is to actually sell stuff, to have merchandise, to sell t-shirts. They, they have a fantastic design. And to become, they do tours. The, the, art, the social practice is tours of New York City from a black perspective. And if you ever come to New York City, I highly recommend, it will blow your mind to think of where black people were and what they contributed by walking through those neighborhoods. This is a brilliant artist, I think, who will, and that's his performance. But he charges money for those, I mean, charges different money for different, he has also free events. Um, I went to, so he has something called Ner Nerdy Thursdays, which is a, an example, it's, it's very not nerdy, it's a very hip event. Uh, I went to this event uh, to, weeks or three weeks ago, whatever. Entirely black audience talking to a black uh, historian about the history of New York, different angles on the history of New York City. So it's, but the economic model is to become a tour company and a merchandise company. That's how they want to fund it. Not as a nonprofit, but as a for-profit organization like other companies that give tours of New York City. I mean, so, you know, the problem is, I'm giving you this example, but it hasn't happened yet. I mean, he gives tours, he charges for them, but that's not the whole economic basis. Is it on? Yeah. Um, thank you very much for creating that space for conversation. I wonder if somebody like Joseph Boyes would be alive today if he would join something like Extinction Rebellion as a group that kind of looks at creative ways of civil disobedience and that somehow links to, I guess, this conversation about transformation. Uh, let's say it that way. A couple of years ago, there was an interesting debate going on organized by Jana von Heiswick and a number of socially engaged artists said, it's very nice, governments have discovered by now, it's great to hand over all that participation to artists, artistic collaborative community projects. And meanwhile, we do business as usual. And the question came up if that type of social engaged art uh, yeah, movement really needs to engage in civil disobedience in order to say that's all very nice. You know, you share responsibility with us, but not power. And when it comes to power, this is where it becomes tough. So I do wonder about, you know, um, apart from the whole funding issue, to kind of consider where do we engage and how do we engage? And yes, always in favor of creating, let's say, good and better models for the commons. So um, yeah, I so wonder this, what people think about it. I mean, that, that also, so at the beginning, I was talking about, you know, the civil rights movement and the feminist movement, which was not arts. These were, these were social movements, right? And so one of the questions is how to reintegrate into social movements. Are there ways that you could be a participant in a social movement through a social practice? Like if you're good at that, you could, yeah, you could, do uh, yeah, you want the mic again? You could uh, join uh, an environmental activist group, whatever. Um, and the other thing I just would like to acknowledge is that, so we're sitting in a space, so Instar, in Cuba, people have spent time in jail, including Tanya Bergera, on the basis of their actions, which are for, on behalf of freedom of expression and stuff. So there are high stakes uh, around these issues that the government recognizes enough to imprison people. And that's when it gets really serious, right? Do you want to? 
I, I wanted to put it out there. Um, I was really inspired by the exhibition. I think it was at Rara or Ruru House. I forgot the name of it. Um, and they were talking about like ecosystems and different economic models and regenerative economics. It's been around. You know, people have been talking about it, shared economics, gift economy. But you know, what what does it really mean in practice? And I thought it was really fascinating that this group of artists is actually challenging that and taking it upon themselves. Like, you know, let's forget about doing it top down. Like, let's try and do something within us. How could we reinvest and and create a sort of circular economy within us? And I think that's also like where I. I want to see where artists can can come and contribute something or open up conversations because I think the beauty of the arts is that when we work so closely with communities on the ground, you start to change mindset and behaviors at a level that you know a lot of top down policies won't be able to reach. And I I find this this whole thing about long term sustainability, long term engagement, which is so critical to impact. It's so difficult to get if you don't have the if people cannot feed themselves, which is what you know artists doing this work really struggle. I've been doing this research for years, and then what does this mean for us、um, moving forward? How could we how could we create the system shift from this kind of bottom up ways of working, starting from money? You know, no matter how idealistic we want to be, money is still important because you have to feed yourself, you have to feed your family, and it's also like you know psychologically it gets draining if you don't have that sort of sustenance. And how could we? You know, really look at this situation, and if governments were to be involved, I, I really like what you were doing with the government and trying to measure impact because I think that's something that artists don't do very well. But then there are social impact bonds that are out there. What if we have an art impact bond? You know, how would things change, and how would the sort of long-term financial sustainability look? So there, so there is a group in the United States called Upstart Collab. Which is a、um, arts-based impact investing model. So one of the things that that is happening right now in the United States is, look, there's something that people are worried about: toxic philanthropy, right? We're taking money from oil, we're taking money from this, that, which is terrible and has to be looked at. But where's your endowment? If you are the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, you have three billion dollars in your back pocket, which is your endowment. Put that to work in terms of social impact. And、it's just beginning. So, but but Upstart Collab does have a seven and a half million dollar fund right now. Beginning, they want to make it a hundred million dollars to invest in the kind of thing you're talking about. To invest in the arts, to invest in artists, to invest. It's a capitalist model, by the way. It's investing, but it is、uh, would be building artist housing and things like. But to invest big chunks of money because the art world has it in their endowments already. Anybody else? Got a question, a comment, a complaint? Yes. Hold on. Don't speak until you get the mic. You have to turn up, turn it on. Yes.、Uh, not a complaint, <laughs> a question. So here, documenta, we see、uh, different ways of how to show the results or processes of social engaged art. And wondering、uh, around, I ask myself: so, is an exhibition? Even if it's a long one, is it the right form to to show this kind of art, or should we have something else? And I think there's a certain struggle with this, also in books like like your wonderful book. You have pictures, but it does not really show you what happened. So how can you how can you make people understand what could remain from a workshop or a collective initiative? Yeah, yeah. So what she's referring to is in. Book. All the pictures pretty much look the same. Just a bunch of people standing around talking to each other, right? And which is that's what it is. And it's incredible. They're very different projects, but in photography they look the same. So, but, <laughs> and I don't know what to do about that. If you have ideas, because、um, I'm working on another book. But the,、um, I don't know. So here, and people have come back to、uh, have having seen this and seen the whole thing. Are often talking about this question of the exhibition format. And I've just been here for one day, so I'm just beginning to look at the show. But one of the things that that is interesting here is how things kind of fade into one another, and there's a little bit of blurry area. You can't sometimes tell exactly. The labels are harder to find, but yet when you find them, they're off. It's a, so I kind of like that, right? That it's kind of this fluidity. But the other thing is, you know, some of the artists are better than others at representing it. Like so, this、uh, Ben. Uh, Bangladeshi pavilion. It's just incredible. Oh my God! It's just beautiful. As a work of art, forget about the garden and everything else. If you just 
I, but then that, that's on top of it, but it's the, the sort of basket weaving is so beautiful and the way it's set. So, but that's in a way separate from the question of the social, right? But it's an environment for the social. So I think that's very successful. I haven't been there when they're serving food, but I think it's probably be pretty cool. So it's, it's a social environment that has this shell around it, which is, but then there are other ones where it's just like, yeah, you kind of, so I, I got it. When I, first time I ever went into public in a way with an exhibition of this kind of art, uh, was something called Uncommon Sense at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. Had Rick Lowe and Mel Chin and Merle Eucalese, these artists, some others. And the review in the New York, terrible review in the New York Times said, I'm sorry, but it looks to me like all the fun and all the important activity happened before the show opened. Like it was the social project was really cool. She was acknowledging that, but it wasn't that interesting to look at an exhibition. I completely disagreed with her at the time, but it kind of resonated in my thought process like maybe and then again with the immigrant movement tanya Bergera's project in um queens nobody came no art world people came but it was just this ongoing environment and i remember talking to um to people who had been there who had been there the whole seven years and experienced it and i said well what was the result and this one woman put it best i think she said it was a way of acting that's what the project was. It was a way of acting in the world. So when coronavirus hit, Corona Queens, and there was a moment when Corona Queens was the world center of the virus in the entire world. I talked to someone who said 106 students in the public school there had lost one or both of their parents right at the beginning of the pandemic. It was horrific. What I heard from the people who had been part of immigrant movement for all those years was that that way of acting that they had absorbed and taught themselves during those seven years was what kicked in, which was a collective way of acting, a mutual aid way of acting. It, it made a big difference in terms of bringing help to people. They had the social network set. That was the results of the art project. It wasn't a picture, it wasn't, but it was a thing, a real thing in the world, which was a way of acting. And so how could you represent a way of acting in, a, in an exhibition? I don't know, but maybe there's a way of thinking about that uh, as a representative. Yeah, anyway, that's my... Maybe it's also the audience who, had, who needs to get used to look at this art in a different way. So maybe it's not the art which needs to change. So. Right, right. That's a good point. Yeah, right. Maybe it's the deficit is the audience. Although here's an example of that. So we did a, um, a social project in the, uh, especially Mexican community, but in the Lat Latino community in Queens, there's a, uh, you know, the famous uh, professional wrestling, so Lucha Libre, right? So there's an artist from Queens, Latino guy, who was completely ripped physique. I mean, he looked like a professional wrestler, and he trained and trained, and then did a whole publicity campaign, and then did a Lucha Libre performance in Corona Plaza, the plaza I showed, where he wrestled against the invisible man. When he wrestled against the invisible man, all the kids in the audience got it immediately. Of course, they probably wrestle in the invisible man themselves, practicing for their day uh, in a ring. The parents were like, that's a bunch of bullshit. There's only one person in that ring. You know, It's like, of course there is. Use your imagination. But I felt like that artist, Sean Leonardo, could speak to audiences. He just couldn't speak to adult audiences who had lost their imagination to understand what he was doing. So I think that, you know, we, there's education problem, which is lack of arts education. And then there's an education problem, which is the education we get educates us away from being imaginative, like a child. That's the thought. Anyway, one more question or no more questions? You got one more? That's it. All right, thank you everybody. Thank mm -hmm. you.